turn with us to the book of John, chapter number 6. Brother Eddie testifying a perfect segue right into what we'll preach tonight. And uh, I can tell you it's hot off the press. Uh, just the Lord gave me a thought. Uh, I guess early on in the morning, this morning, and uh, I wasn't able to get get it all on, on paper until just before I walk through the doors tonight. But I uh, feel like the Lord wants to talk to the church tonight. If you're here and you're not saved, then I, I don't have to preach a salvation message for you to give your heart and life to the Lord. Yeah, if you need healing in your body, I don't have to preach on divine healing for you to have faith, amen, and receive healing. So while I, I may not deal with the lost, and while I might not deal with divine healing, I, I still believe you can get what you need at the altar. But the Lord has impressed on my heart to, to deal with the church tonight, with the, the body of Christ, uh, from a passage of Scripture that you will find in all four Gospels. This is one of the few stories that you will find recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, just there's some things God showed me uh, just early this morning. This afternoon, that I just want to share with you to be a, a help and encourage, uh, an encouragement to the body of Christ. But we'll begin our reading with John chapter number six, verse number one. We'll read down through verse number thirteen. Verse number one: Read. And after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And, uh, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Any time. The Lord asks a question or the Spirit of God prompts you with a question. He already knows what he's going to do. Amen. He just wants to know your heart and what you think he's going to do. <laughs> Amen. He already, he, he already knows the end uh, uh, from the beginning. Our todays were his yesterday. Amen. And tomorrow he's already there. Time is no barrier, no distance for him. But he asked the question and he knew and himself what he was going to do. And Philip answered him and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's Peter, but Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a little lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down and Number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he gave thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. And therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments. Of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Christ not only met the need, but when Christ got done, there was more than what they started with. I want to preach to you if the Lord will help us for just a few moments. Not going to preach very long tonight if the Lord will help me. But I want to preach Christ's example for ministry. I want to deal with the church tonight. And I want to preach on Christ's example for ministry. If you will, ask God's help and anointing tonight. Father, I love you. I'm so thankful for your word. I pray that you would add your blessings to the reading of the word tonight. It's spirit, it's truth, and it is life. And oh, God, I'm asking for the unction, the anointing, the empowerment of your spirit to rest upon us as we endeavor to preach your word as you have laid it upon our hearts tonight. I pray that you would strengthen, encourage, edify your church, your body tonight to be the body that you would have us be, that we could be effective in ministry 
as you were effective in ministry, that we can reach our world and we can minister to those that have great needs among us. God, we're going to be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. If I can get a little bit more. Oh, nobody's up there. Um, I'll just holler real loud. Sorry, Brother Jason. Thank you. I'm flying out for Cuba tomorrow. Keep us in your prayers. We'll be going down to preach. My throat's scratching for some reason tonight. And that is not a good thing if I go into it. Amen with a bad throat. <clears throat> but I want us to look at the scripture and see Christ's example for ministry. The first thing that I want us to notice is that Jesus in this text saw something that nobody else around him saw. For the Bible says when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may be uh, that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus looked up, he saw the multitude, he saw the congregation, and immediately he identified a need. He saw the problem that these people had been following him all day. They had been sitting out in the the, the blister and heat one. Uh, version of the gospel says that this was a desert place. This was a desolate place. And while they were there, all day they had gone without eating. And Jesus, immediately when he saw the people, he identified a need. And in Mark's account, in Mark chapter number 6, it varies just a little bit in, in some of the, the minor details. The whole story is is the, applicable and the same, but the Bible says that when the day was far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place and the time is far past. The disciples told Jesus three words. They said unto him, send them away. Jesus looked on the, the, the scene, the multitude. He identified a need. These people are hungry. The disciples looked at the same multitude and their solution for the problem was, Lord, just send them away. Just send them away. Let them go home. There's no way that we can meet this need. There's no way that we can fix the problem. They saw the same scenario right in, in front of them, but they interpreted the problem two totally different ways. For you see, the disciples saw the same problem and the same need but they missed it. Their solution was to send them away. Jesus saw this as problematic. It's hot. They're hungry. Some may famish in the way. Some may experience heat and exhaustion. Some may not have the, the energy to go home. And so we see Jesus and the disciples looking at the same thing and having two vastly different recommendations. You see, this is a classic example on the part of the disciples of overlooking the problem. For you see, they saw the people, but they did not see the need the same way that Jesus did. They, they, they did not realize what was at stake. For you see, they had sight, but they lacked vision. They could see with their eyes, but they lacked vision. And before we cast too many stones at the disciples, if we'll be honest with ourselves, and oftentimes we are more like the disciples than we are Jesus. Jesus saw an opportunity here. The disciples saw an easy fix. They overlooked the problem. They're like so many people that may have 20-20 vision, but yet they cannot see. Listen, uh, uh, when we encounter such scenarios, my prayer tonight is for the church that he would give us his eyes to see the way he sees. Amen. So that we can realize the need the same way that Jesus realized the need. I mean, you see, when presented with the need, many disciples saw the problem. But only Jesus saw the opportunity. 
Let that sink in. The disciples solved the same problem that Jesus did. But they missed the opportunity. Jesus said these people are hungry. Where can we find bread that, that they may eat? Peter, look at this. Solve the problem. He said, Lord, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient of them that every uh, one of them may take a little. Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother also solved the problem. He said, there's a little boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many people? How are these? How are just five loaves and, and two fishes? How are they going to fix the problem? You see, the disciples saw the problem, but they only, or saw the, the need, but they only focused on the problem. If we're not careful, we will go into the same exact mindset. When we are presented with a need, we only see the problems associated with the need. We only see our lack and our limitations. We only see the, the negative aspects of this. We like the disciples. We think it look logically. We see practically. But if that's the only thing that we're consumed with, we're going to miss the opportunity to minister. For Brother Eddie that just talked about it, he could focus on the negative. Of a lightning strike in his house. Or he can look at the opportunity. That there's going to be some people knocking on my door. Coming to me. I don't have to go to them. God's sending them to me. To present the gospel. Amen. To minister to hearts. And to lives. And we by tendency. By nature. Humans often tend to be negative people. That just focus on the negative. Don't just focus on the negative. But look as Christ did. For the opportunity. Opportunity. Look for the opportunity to minister. Amen. Don't be caught up in the run and the cycle and the routine of life. Because if you are, you will miss God given opportunities. Could it be the disciples were so caught up into looking ahead at the next crusade? At the next village that they were going to. At the next ministry opportunity. Could it be that they were looking at Jesus' agenda and his travel schedule and the, the next ministry assignment. That in this, or in this instance, they missed the opportunity to minister. If we're not careful as the church, we can fall into this same rut. To where we're so busy doing ministry that we fail to minister. Let that sink in. We can be so caught up and busy in the Sunday morning and the Sunday night and the Wednesday night. I've got to get the mind of God. I've got to get the heart of God. I've got to get the message. And all of those things are needful. I've got to pray for the anointing. I've got to, to get along with God and focus on Sunday, on Sunday night, on, on Wednesday. I've got to focus on this revival coming up. That when we go to Walmart on Tuesday, we're numb to those that are around us. That we're numb in Piggly Wiggly when we're there to pick up a can of rice and beans and, or a bag of rice and a can of beans and then go about it our merry way and we want to get in, out, and on our way, that we fail to capitalize on the opportunity of those that are around us, that are hurting, that are lost, that are undone. I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but don't let ourselves be so caught up in rigid routines and our agendas. Don't even be so caught up in ministry that we fail to be ministers everywhere that we are. Everywhere that we go. That was the disciples, for example. They saw, uh, they, they missed it originally. They didn't see as Christ saw. Secondly, they saw the, the problem. They didn't see the opportunity. Third, they were busy with their schedule and what they were focusing on that, that they missed it. We see three poor examples from the disciples. 
But now let us look and focus on the example of Christ. Jesus immediately sensed the need. Jesus saw the opportunity. He saw the open door and he capitalized on the moment. Because for Jesus, it went deeper than sight. It went deeper than sight. It went deeper than seeing there was a need, than seeing the lack, than, 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 than feeling or than, than seeing the, the, the need around him. But the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, that when Jesus came out, he saw much people and was moved with compassion for them. You see, it went deeper than just seeing the need. Jesus felt the need. Jesus realized the need. The Bible says that he was moved with compassion. Compassion in the Greek means to have bowels that yearn. For us, that may not mean a whole lot. Where do you get having bowels that yearn and compassion? How does that intertwine? I've shared this with you before, but it bears repeating again. In biblical days, the bowels were considered the center middle point of man's emotions. The same way that the, the, the bowels are the center point anatomically, within the human body. When they would have a, a, a wife or a, a kid and saying that I love you with all of my heart, they would say, my bowels yearn for you. Men, take note of that. Let me know if that works out for you. <laughs> Look at your wife say, honey, my bowels yearn for you. You see, for us, it would be the same as saying, I love you with all of my heart. We consider the heart to be the center point of our emotions. They consider the bowels. And so the word compassion in the Greek means to have bowels that yearn. It, it, it means to be moved. When, when Christ saw the need, the center point, every emotion was touched. He was touched to the very core of his being. And he was moved with compassion. Amen. When we see a need, folks, we shouldn't just see it with our eyes. We shouldn't just stop with sight. But we, amen, should feel the need. We should feel the burden. The burden should consume us exactly like it consumed Christ. For Christ, it went deeper than eye level. Amen. It came in his eyes. But it, it, it simmered down and it consumed all of his being to where he it, it forced him to action. It forced him to move. Too many times, Christians, we can see the need. We can see a brother and her sister in need. We can see the, the lost and the undone. But that is as far as it goes. But if it's are, uh, as the burden goes is sight uh, and what we see with our eyes then we're not acting as Christ acted uh, Christ moved uh, with compassion uh, it led him to do something uh, about the problem at hand uh, too often the church is on the sidelines uh, amen just being uh, bystanders in the grandstands cheering uh, amen while life passes us by God uh, amen it's not his will for us to be a passive church uh, amen in the grandstand uh, being a bystanders, but God uh, wants to move us into action. Uh, God wants us to see the need, uh, but God also wants us to feel the need. To be moved with compassion. In this instance, this compassion consumed Christ. I want to ask us as the church, when is the last time, and this is a rhetorical question, I don't need an answer, but I want it to be a thought-provoking question to ponder in your mind. When is the last time that I have felt a burden so strong for somebody or something that it moved me? That it moved me. That my heart burned within me. You see, some people, when they get this feeling, they wonder, God, is this you or not? God, is, is, am I feeling this? Is this just me or is this flesh? Well, I want to give you the litmus test very quickly. 
Ask yourself two questions. Number one, is what I feel being led to do going to glorify God or is it going to glorify my flesh? If it glorifies your flesh, it is not God. Because God is never going to lead you to do something that's going to promote your flesh. Next question I ask, does it glorify God? If it glorifies God, then the devil or your flesh is not going to lead you to do anything that's going to bring glory and honor to God. So, test number one is what I'm feeling in me. Is it of God or not? Is this a God-given burden that glorifies flesh? No. If it will bring glory and honor to the kingdom of God, then yes. But then, ask yourself, is this a burden that's going to go away? Or is this a burden that's going to stay with me until I do something about it? Because how many times do we have a thought, it would be good to do this. It would be good to do that. And then, squirrel, something else comes by. You know, it would be good to do this. And it would be good to do that. And we chase this and we chase that because here's another good idea. And, and this would be so good and it would be so glamorous. Listen, a God-given burden is not going to change. When God burdens your heart to do something, He puts His finger on it and He's leading you and prompting you to do something and when you go to bed, that burden's going to be there. When you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, that burden's going to be there. When you wake up in the morning, uh, that burden's not going to go anywhere. Uh, on your lunch break, it's going to be there. Uh, amen. At afternoon dinner time when you're uh, eating with your family but your mind is a million miles away, that's that thing uh, that you can't uh, get your mind off that is consuming you. Uh, amen. What, what is God doing? And He's burdening your heart uh, and He's moving you. Uh, he's prompting you. Uh, there is an opportunity. Uh, here is an open door. Don't miss the moment. Don't miss the opportunity. Oh my God, my prayer tonight is that God would once again burden us, the body of Christ, with His amen, indefinite will in this hour that would be unmistakable, that would be unconfused, amen, and would not go undone. But we as the body of Christ, we would see the need, we would realize the need, and we would do do something about it. Amen. There is no room for apathy in this late hour. So easy to be apathetic. So easy to just go through the motions of life. But when God has given you a burden, we cannot be apathetic toward the things of God. In Christ's example, he saw the need. He felt the need. He was moved with compassion. It consumed him. And the third thing we see in Christ's example is he met the need. He met the need. For John 6.10 said, make the disciples to sit down. Or make the men to sit down. The disciples were over here focusing on the problem. They missed it. They said, send them away. If the disciples had their way, there would have been no feeding of the 5,000. Never would have happened. Their solution to all of this was just, let's, let, let's go to the next town. Let's, let's do the next thing. But Jesus said, make them sit down. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes. One writer says that he blessed them, break them, and distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise, the fishes as much as they would. When Jesus saw the need, viewed the opportunity, Jesus did not give up until the problem was solved. He didn't have a fly-by-night burden that just 
this would be good if somebody else would do this. Jesus was moved with a burden that would not go away until these people were filled. Now I want you to think about the problems in our world. The ministry opportunities that we have. You may see a glaring problem and think there's no way that I can make a difference. Jesus, he didn't stop until all 5,000 were fed. He didn't, he didn't stop and just say, well, half of them got something. The, the one in greatest need got something. No, he kept ministering until all were ministered to. You can say, God's led me to, 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 to rehab, to work with the addicts. There's no way that I can solve all of the addiction problem in America. God may lead you to the convalescent home and there's no way that you can develop relationships with all of them. And you say that, that there's no way that uh, I can uh, deal with the, the drug epidemic. There, there's no way I can deal with all of the people in the hospital. So uh, I mean, why do, why do I even get started? I'm reminded of the story of the young boy that went down to the seashore. While he was there, he noticed tens of thousands of starfish that had come up on the, the, up on the shore and they could not get back into the water. And he noticed, he said, these starfish are, they're, they're going to die. But there's nothing that I can do to save all of these. I can't make a difference. But he looked off in the distance and there was one old man. He was picking up the starfish one by one, throwing them back in the water. Picking up one, throwing back in the water. Picking them up one by one. As in the, the young boy ran up to him and said, Sir, what are you doing? There's, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm saving starfish. He said, sir, there is no way that you can save all of these starfish. And he didn't, didn't deter the old man. He kept picking them up one by one and throwing them into the water. He said, sir, don't you see that this is a futile attempt? There's nothing that you can do to save all of them. You can't make a difference. And the old man looked up, picked a starfish, threw it in the water. He said, I made a difference to that one. Are you looking at the problem? Are you focusing on the opportunity? I mean, you may not be able to fix the drug epidemic in America, but you can make the difference in one addict's life. You may not be able to solve all of the problems at every hospital in America. Amen. But God can lead you to do something to fix something in room 172. Amen. Of a man or a woman that needs a miracle in their body. Oh, God, help us tonight. I mean, Jesus, he capitalized on the opportunity. He made a difference in one, on one, on one. And he did not stop until all 5,000 were fed. Amen. He saw the need. View the opportunity, huh? amen, and made a difference in their lives. This example of ministry. Notice two things I want you to notice right here. Notice the method Jesus used. Now, Jesus is God. It's a well-identified fact. Jesus could do anything that he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. He could have spoke the word and everybody had Ruth's Chris Steakhouse steaks, baked potato, and salads on a plate with silverware ready to eat 2,000 years before there was a Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. He could have done that. He's God. He can do anything. He spoke into nothing and made everything so if he wanted to, to minister to these hungry people's needs. He could have done it. He could have made the fish jump out of the sea already uh, fried, battered up with french fries uh, and hush puppies. I better shut up. I'm about to make myself hungry. He could have done it. He could have spoke the word and they just fall out of the sky. 
bread, fish for everybody. But notice what God used to perform this miracle. A major, major point for us. This miracle was made possible by Christ. But it was only possible because Christ moved men. It was a boy that gave up his fish. It was a boy that gave up the bread. He could have been like me, this boy. My dad growing up, he wanted to teach me physical responsibility and not to blow money. Elementary school that started out with little by the time I graduated or by the time he passed when I was 15, it got up to 20 bucks a week. He gave me $20 every Monday morning and said, boy, that's all you're getting for the rest of the week. You want to spend it all on Monday at snack? Spend it all on Monday at snack. But don't come asking me for any more money. This is your lunch. This is your snack. And if you have anything left over with it, you spend on it what you want to. Well, I got smart. I learned to live without snack. I pocketed that money. I'd eat my plate, and I'd instead of buying seconds, I'd eat what my neighbor wouldn't eat. I'd just break it over on my plate so I could pull up my money, and I could buy what I wanted. And that was how I, I bought, and I can guarantee you I wasn't buying anything good. But this boy could have been the exact same, same thing. That could have been his allotment for the week. And he said, bless God, I'm... I'm going to buy me some loaves and some fish. I'm going to eat good today. He could have saved up his money all week and this could have been his payday. Or that mama could have sent him down to the market and said, Son, you go buy supper tonight. Here's your money. What you got to buy or what you buy has got to take care of the whole family tonight because I ain't cooking anything. I'm tired. So this boy... Whatever scenario it is, we don't know, but he had it in his hands. But when he come to Jesus and he saw his need, here was a boy that was willing to surrender everything he had for the cause of Christ. He only had five loaves and two fishes. But you see what God is able to do with a man that will surrender everything to him. You see what God is able to do. You can say, I don't have uh, much resource. I, I don't have uh, much money to give. This thing goes far deeper than money. Don't equip your surrender to just financial means. Uh, I mean, you can say, I, I don't have uh, a lot of time. I don't have uh, X, Y, Z. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm limited in what I can do. Uh, little is much when God is in it. Uh, amen. If all of you got uh, is five loaves and two small fishes, uh, when you put it in the hands of God, uh, God's able to turn it uh, into an all-you-can-eat buffet. Uh, hallelujah. Amen. God used this boy uh, to feed the multitude. Amen. And God will still move men to surrender everything to put it in his hands. And what we put in the hands of God when he gets done with it is more than enough to meet the need of the hour. He desires someone that's willing to surrender their all to him. You can say God doesn't need anything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He doesn't need anything. On one hand, you're right. God doesn't need anything in this world to increase or decrease His power. He's all-sufficient. On one hand, you're right. But on second hand, you're also wrong. Because God still needs men. God still needs men that have put the five loaves and the two fishes in their hands, in his hands. He still needs men that will surrender to the will of God. He still needs young people that will allow him to help himself to their lives. Amen. He used this man, used this boy to feed 5,000. But notice, he also used the disciples to distribute the blessing. 
If we can see anything here in Christ's example for ministry, we see this. That Christ, His desire is to move in, by, and through men. Moved on the young boy. Moved on the disciple. In all four Gospels you will find the same terminologies that Jesus took the loaves. When He had given thanks, distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were sitting out. He used the disciple to channel His blessings, amen, to the ones that were in need. Amen. As ministers, and whether you're preaching, amen, or whether you're teaching a class, whether you're witnessing, whether you're sharing your testimony, you are a minister of the gospel. And as ministers, we see a pattern that is vital for us. We must first receive from Christ is all blessings uh, are orchestrated by Him. Uh, and once we receive, it's our job to simply distribute uh, what He has given us. Yeah, That's all ministry is uh, for preachers is getting the mind of God. Uh, is hearing His voice uh, and us delivering what He tells us to say. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, if we add anything to ministry, uh, and then we're missing the, po the boat. Uh, if we take away anything from that, uh, amen, then we're missing the boat. All it is is hearing his heart. Amen. Feeling his burden and sharing what he would have us say to the rest of the world. That is our mandate is ministry. Christ would give it to us and we give it to those in need. He used people. When we realize and we come to the conclusion that we're nothing but distributors of God's goodness. We've come to the focal point of our lives. I'm nothing. I'm nobody in myself. But my purpose in life is to be a distributor of the blessings of God. As God has blessed me, I am then to in turn disseminate those blessings to the world. Freely you have received freely give. As God opens up revelation to us in his word, it's not just so we can say, I got a revelation. It's not so we can try to make ourselves look smarter and be egotistical about what we have received. No. It's about sharing it with the world. Everything Christ gives us is with the intent that we give it away. That it funnels through us. We're nothing but conduits and channels through which God's blessings flow. We're nothing more than distributors. So the people is the method that God used. Number one, to produce the blessing. Once the blessing was there, he took it, he break it. And then he used people to distribute it. But if we just see this as fishes and loaves, to feed a physical appetite. I believe, Brother Daniel, we're missing the whole point of this story. And don't get me wrong. It was physically. Jesus had to produce a meal to satisfy the physical hunger. But notice what he gave them. I don't believe it was by mistake that that young lad had fishes. And he had loaves. And then when he brought it to Jesus, Jesus gave thanks. And then he broke it. That bread we know is a type of Christ. And Jesus himself says, I am the bread of life. He is the eternal bread of heaven. That bread that, that he blessed and he broke it as if he was breaking himself. And giving it unto them. That flesh that was broken. That was significant. Uh, of his death that was to come by the cross. Uh, when his flesh would be rent in twain. Uh, when it would be broken. Uh, and pulverized on the cross. Uh, amen. You see it was bread and fish. Uh, that sustained them physically. Uh, but more importantly Jesus was saying. It's the bread uh, and my flesh. Uh, that's going to sustain uh, your spiritual being. Uh, amen. You can try to find something else in this world. Uh, to satisfy your hunger. Uh, and you'll never find it. The end. 
answer is in the bread. The answer is in the flesh. A man speaking of his body, the flesh of Christ that was broken for all mankind. You see, the only thing that can fix a broken world is a broken Savior. A man that was broken and poured out for all of mankind. A man, the fish and the bread, yes, it satisfied their physical hunger, but for you and I, it's still the bread. It's still the fish that'll satisfy the hunger of addiction, that'll satisfy the hunger of pornography, that'll satisfy the hunger of fleshly appetite. The only answer is the bread and the flesh of Christ. Jesus was and is the only thing that can satisfy a starving world. Somebody can come to us and say, there's a need. I don't have groceries. We can glance over the need or we can do something to help them. But if we're not careful, oftentimes we'll be enablers. Say amen to me somebody. If we're not careful, we'll just enable them. I know sometimes there's things that happen that's no fault of their own. God puts people in our path that we can help. But every month that they're coming knocking on your door, I need this, I need this, I need this. You've got to ask yourself the question, why do you need this? What's the problem at hand? Well, they're buying other things for addictions instead of paying the light bill. Instead of paying groceries for their kids. And if we're just if we're just handing out, we're just enabling them in their problem. We need to be handing them out bread and fish. We need to be handing them out the gospel. Brother, I'll pay you a light bill this month, but if you want it. Come to church with me on Sunday morning. Have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Before you get my money, you're going to get my heart. Let me sit down and talk to you for about five minutes about a man that can change your life. Throw out a little bit of fish. Throw out a little bit of those loaves. Give them Christ. Give them the gospel. Because he's the only thing. He's the only one that can fix a broken world. Jesus saw the need. He felt the need. He met the need. How did he meet it? He met it with himself. How are we going to meet the needs of this world? We can only meet the needs of this world with Christ. He's the only hope for a dying world. He's the only hope for, for mankind that we have. And if the church is silent, then the greatest message that has ever known, been known will be silenced. But we've got to take Christ's example. We've got to see, envision, envision the need. We've got to be moved with the need to, to, to let it consume us. And we've got to do something about it. Because forth, cursed, and if you'll come help me, I'm done. We see in the story, Jesus saw it. Jesus felt it. Jesus met the need. But I want you to notice something here. Jesus blessed those who blessed others. Because the Bible tells us in John chapter number 6, and when they were filled, it didn't say that when they had two bites, when they were filled. He said it to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Jesus, don't throw anything away. You can say your life is over. It's too far gone. Listen, Jesus hasn't thrown you away. You can say my life is broken. It's nothing but fragments. Jesus ain't going to throw you away. He didn't in this story. He still won't today. But he said, therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. What happened to the 12 baskets? We don't rightly know. Did the disciples carry it home with them? No, 
don't know. Did Jesus give it back to the boy that had so graciously given up his five loaves and his two fish? We don't know. But the Bible says that it was there. Whether the boy took it home with him or whether the disciples took it home with, with them, we don't know. But the fact of the matter was is that the people that God used left that place with a blessing. God blessed those that he used as great if not greater than the 5,000. Which boils it down to this. When you minister, God may lay on your heart a certain ministry, a certain task, a certain thing to do. When you walk in obedience to him, I guarantee you, you may go to be a blessing, but oftentimes God will bless you far greater in return. There's been times financially to where I gave sacrificially, and before the end of the day, God gave it back. But I am not preaching about money. If that's all that we get out of this, that's what for so much of the people this is, is when we talk about ministry, it's investing into the kingdom. Does God need your money? God wants your money to further the gospel. But if that's all ministry is to you is put money in the offering plate, then we've missed it, folks. God can do far more with your mouth than he can do with your pocketbook. God can do far more with your life than he can with dollar bills in your pocket. But when you walk in obedience and you live your life to be a blessing, God is going to be a debtor to no man. And he's going to bless you far greater than he uses you to be a blessing. That's not, I've gone to some of the poorest places on earth. And there's been times where you do so willingly. There's other times where you do so kind of begrudgingly. Lord, I wish you'd send somebody else here. <laughs> Lord, it's hot in Africa. There's no air conditioner in Africa. There's no deodorant in some of those places. Brother Eddie talked about that the other day. Lord, send somebody else. But you go and you get there with the body of Christ. You get around brothers and sisters in the faith. You feel the presence of God. God sweeps through the place. He blesses you far greater than you were a blessing to them. God's going to be a debtor to no man. The Bible says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging for bread. You invest in the kingdom of God. God will bring dividends into that. More than we can ever imagine. But when we are willing participants in ministry, oftentimes God uses us to be a blessing, but He will bless us much greater in return. We do not serve to get blessings. To do so would just simply be earning a wage. You do something, you expect to get something in return. It's not what we do it for. But God will bless those that allows him to bless others. And so in this, we see Christ's example for ministry. We see how he responded to oppressing need. And these are the same thing he wants us as the body of Christ to do. When you go to the job tomorrow, don't just go to clock in and get a check, but look for opportunities to be a blessing. Look for an opportunity to testify. Don't just look at the negatives of everything that's going wrong. But look at the, the opportunities to be a catalyst for the gospel's sake. Don't just focus on or overlook and gloss over the, the glare of needs. It's easy to do. But focus our eyes to see the problem as Christ would have us to see. And allow them access to our lives. To meet the need at hand. When you put what you can into God's hand. And you do what you can. God will do what you can't. 
I firmly believe that. When you do what you can, God will do what you can't. And God will take that and use it to be a blessing to others. Amen. I want to encourage us this week as we go. I know we're not shouting for the chandeliers. I know it's simple gospel preaching tonight. But if we will allow God, God will talk to your heart. God will begin to open up the doors of opportunities. You won't look at the world the same. You won't look at the broken the same. You won't look at the hurting the same. But you'll see an opportunity, just a crack in the door, to throw them some loaves and some fish, to give them Christ. His body was broken for us. And a broken Savior still fixes broken lives. Savior whose body was broken still can make me in whole. I wonder if we could, if we could come to this altar in an altar of surrender and give God our all.